Hey, good evening, and welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. And this year we have another series because we have another town meeting day coming, of which, of course, you can vote ahead of time, and many of you will vote ahead of time. But I hope that all of you will engage and actually show up and vote. Uh, tonight we're going to deal with the mayor's race, and we have our incumbent mayor, Ann Watson. And this time we're going to do something very special because with her baby and all, uh, Anne is going to come out on Zoom. So what you're going to do is you're going to hear me in the background asking questions and you're going to see Anne in the foreground. Uh, it's a very engaging conversation and I hope that you'll stay with it. She's going to speak to us about being mayor of Montpelier and why she wants to continue being mayor of Montpelier. Now, this is not the first time that Anne and I have spoken. And when did we speak first? What year? Oh my gosh. Uh, it was nearly 10 years ago, actually, uh, because I, I was um, uh, looking to be appointed to the city council uh, for an open seat. And then I ran to keep that seat a little bit later uh, in that year. So it's been a long time. 10 years. Yeah. What, what, what made you, I say this every time, this is not something new for me. Um, what made you run the first time? What made you want to be appointed? Now, at that time, you were teaching physics at the high school. Yep. You had more than enough to do. You didn't need the small stipend that we pay. What, what brought you forward? Yeah, I am passionate about energy, and particularly renewable energy. And at the time, I was uh, starting to tune into the discussions about district heat and uh, interested in the energy committee. And then actually, because there was this open seat, a friend of mine um, said, you know, you should put your name in. We'd have, I'd recommend that you, that you do that. And so I went with her suggestion and put my name in for the appointment. And mainly because I care uh, deeply about the environment. I mean, as a physics teacher, I spend a lot of time thinking and talking about energy and uh, spending time with kids. You know. Uh, folks who are our future. And so I, um, I'm very invested in uh, energy and renewable energy, and I still am. This is, uh, it continues to be a top priority for me, uh, for the city. Let me bust down, um, for those who do not know, what is District Heat? It's a great question. So uh, if folks are familiar with the smokestack in the middle of town, uh, Directly underneath that is a wood chip burning, uh, uh, basically multiple furnaces um, that are providing heat through underwater hot water pipes to uh, businesses downtown, as well as um, many of the, the city's buildings. Uh, so the uh, city hall, police department, uh, and fire department are all heated with uh, wood chips, and that actually allowed us to get off of burning oil for heat in those buildings, uh, which was very exciting. Uh, so, you know, it's been a system that has evolved over time and um, uh, yeah, it's, it continues to. Now, several downtown businesses also go off the wood chips, yes? Yes, not every business, but there are, there are um, somewhere in the neighborhood of like 17 businesses or buildings. How is it doing fiscally? I, I know that because oil didn't spike the way that we thought it would yet, you know, um, we weren't coming in with the projections that we thought. Where are we now? Yeah, so we um, uh, just had a, a recent uh, audit of, um, or a sort of a report as to how the system was working. And, uh, you know, physically speaking, it is working just fine. And uh, the, the city um, is, is uh, you know making money with it, um, but it is um, it is not it's not as uh, it's not saving folks as much money as they had as we had hoped, and uh, we're very interested actually in the next couple of years to do um, some like reevaluating of um, sort of where we're at with that and what needs to happen next because um, some of the, the businesses that are off takers are actually nonprofits, and uh, so they you know their ability to pay is is uh, different than um, you know, someone who, uh, like a business that is for profit. So um, in any case, it's an ongoing conversation and uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do to make it work for everybody. That was the first. You were involved in the next big energy project, which was the, um, 
the waste treatment plant or yes would you discuss that one and whether it's meeting the projections you hoped oh sure yeah so um i guess it was last year we passed a bond to do significant upgrades on the wastewater treatment facility or the water resource recovery facility is what we call it and uh now, where those is that? Oh, That's it's not down the one on, on the hill. That's the other not one. Not the one on the hill. It's down by uh, the Dog River Fields. It's across the street there. You can see it from the highway. Uh, so the, that plan called for us to start trucking in significantly more of uh, what we call um, fat soils and greases or high density um, um, waste. Uh, or sorry, sorry, high high energy density waste and. Uh, so that has happened and our capacity has increased. And what that means is that we are generating significantly more methane and that is on, on purpose because uh, we are gonna be able to heat the buildings there with that methane and basically take those buildings off of oil uh, for heat as well. And that has been uh, successful. And fiscally speaking, that has been um, more than successful. It's been, uh, doing really very well financially for us. It is quite a boon. Uh, and so uh, we're actually looking at the next phase of this, that what we passed was um, what we called phase one, uh, where we we're starting to generate more methane and that's an energy source. So there was this question of, as to whether we should uh, burn it for electricity or whether we should uh, try to dry the, um, the sludge with it. So like dewater the sludge so that it would be less uh, costly to transport it. Um, and it's, it's looking like that actually might, uh, it is the, the best uh, fiscal solution for us uh, and best use of the energy. And it actually also works out timing wise because we end up with a lot of excess methane in the summer. Um, as it's not being burned for for heat, and that's actually exactly the time that um, the the load for drying sludge is the highest. So that actually works out great. So this next bond um, that is on the um, uh, March first town meeting day ballot is is for this phase two for using um, this energy. Aren't we also talking in that bond of taking another building into the alternative heating grid? Uh, yes, so uh, there is a, um, a part as a part of uh, another bond uh, uh, taking care of um, this one building. Actually, it's the water treatment uh, building, the one up uphill uh, to get that off of burning uh, oil. And so instead, we're we're hoping to put in a like a pellet uh, furnace or pellet boiler up there. And uh, so this is actually one of the first projects that we can check off of our list that came from uh, a series of recommendations from uh, VEIC uh, that we worked with to come up with a, a roadmap for us to uh, achieve net zero energy. Uh, so obviously Acronym that building, one. what's Acronym that? Number one, VEIC. Oh what? yeah, gosh, VEIC. Well, um, so they are the company that- um, What does that stand for? Um, so I know I'm not entirely sure. It's like Vermont Electric um, something, uh, something Corporation. <laughs> yeah, but they're the they're um, the ones that work with um, Efficiency Vermont. So uh, they're sort of the the company behind Efficient Efficiency Vermont. If that helps. <laughs> uh, the energy consultant position. What is that? How much is it budgeted for? What does it do? And what's the accountability on that? What's the metric of success for that position? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the sustainability coordinator, uh, we're, we've budgeted for that uh, about $100,000. And I know that might seem like a lot, but uh, for uh, the typical salary for someone after you include um, uh, benefits often comes to that much anyway. So that is um, uh, sort of a, a, a buffer amount to make sure that we can adequately pay someone. Uh, and so what that role might entail, uh, so just to be clear, to be fair, uh, the um, role of hiring and firing staff, that belongs to the city manager. And so that's um, going to be up to Bill. So the city council has come up with a list of possible uh, job uh, you know, roles, like uh, job description, uh, but that will ultimately be up to the city manager to, um, to adopt and, and enact. What did the city um, council hope to achieve with that position? Yes, so getting to it. 
Um, so there are a lot of things that uh, this person could be doing. You know, for example, they could be managing uh, the district heat system. Uh, we also have this net zero energy goal uh, to uh, achieve net zero for the whole community by 2050. Um, that is something that this person could take on, you know, connecting uh, federal and state dollars with Montpelier residents to ensure that uh, folks who need it the most are receiving uh, assistance in an energy transition. Um, they could also be uh, working with our home energy information ordinance um, in, in terms of uh, support and compliance there, uh, as well as um, helping us with our, our internal green revolving loan fund to uh, identify projects that the city can be doing and, and help uh, use that fund, those dollars uh, wisely to ultimately help save uh, taxpayer dollars. Uh, and there's, there's just a, a number of things um, that uh, we anticipate this person could be doing. Uh, and the accountability there would, you know, like other staff uh, would be to bill to the, our, our city manager. The energy compliance bill, if you want to sell your house, that is yeah. voluntary right now, yes? It is voluntary right now, and uh, we are looking to make it uh, a requirement by July 1st of this year. How much do you anticipate that that, that would add to the cost of selling your house? Uh, so uh, there is some data out there that suggests that regardless of how well a home does, or uh, on you know in terms of energy performance, that having a score like this increases the value of the home uh, by as much as like three percent. Um, so it's not very much, uh, but uh, you know that's that's what the the data uh, suggests so far. So we'll see. But um, you know, I'm, that I'm audit, but that audit would be the person who buys the house or the person who sells the house. Uh, that would benefit the person who sells the house. So that person would end up having to contract someone to do this. Oh no! Um, sorry, that's a great question. No, the uh, coming up with the home energy profile. The, it's called the Vermont Home Energy Profile. Uh, is free, and anyone um, selling their home can do it. There's a, a website you just log in. Um, all of the city um, properties in Montpelier are already preloaded into this um, database with all the publicly available information, things like um, you know square footage of the house and age of the house, uh, number of bedrooms, etc. Um, that's that's already public information, and so starting from there. Someone could just say, I don't want to add any more information. I'm done. Just hit, you know, submit basically, and it'll come up with a, um, an estimate for you. But uh, you can also add more detail if you want to, and it'll make the, the estimate more refined. Let's get to the elephant in the room, the city budget. Sure. The city budget presumes an inflation rate of 7%. Do we believe that households are making 7% more? Than they made last year. Yeah, no, that's that a great question. Wages are up seven percent. Yeah, so when we look at like how are we managing the budget? Yes, that it is seven percent is a lot. Uh, but one of the things that we were really intentional about last year uh, was uh, keeping the inflate the. Um, uh, city budget down to a, a, it was basically flat last year. Uh, so it was about 0.76% uh, uh, of a budget increase. Uh, so altogether, both years t combined, um, the inflation rate, or I'm sorry, the, the, um, uh, uh, the budget stereo. increase amount. Is, what's that? No, no, I was saying it for you. I was prompting you yeah. forward from my little thing up here. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's the both years combined, it's it's about three and a half percent over two years. Um, so in a way, you know, because we had drastically cut the budget um, last year in terms of um, uh, the services that well, the projects that we were doing and even like um, have, we had to furlough staff, et cetera. So of course, coming back to um, a budget that is relatively normal for us is going to look like um, quite a jump. But isn't this inflationary towards the future as well, that we're bringing all those people back? And this will yeah. probably be held on to in the future. So it might be difficult to meet a lower inflation rate in the future. Well, that's that's possible. Um, we, I sort of anticipate that, um, that this is uh, a jump um, that's one time as we get back into um, what we hope is a, a normal budget for us. And 
uh, you know, what, what I'm hearing from businesses downtown is that um, business is coming back, that folks uh, are returning, and that's really very encouraging. And so the hope is that as COVID starts to uh, ideally disappear, that it will only continue to um, get better. And so our, our, our position for uh, the budget should also, um, al also get better as well. Is there anything else that's an increase in the operating budget except for taking those people back? Uh, well, so there is actually some um, increased money in the police budget, and I know that that uh, might be of some concern to a number of folks. Uh, but just to be clear, that was not a result of like, um, you know, adding another officer particularly, but rather um, we are adding uh, uh, body cams uh, or uh, body worn cameras uh, for the department, which should help with um, transparency and accountability for the police department, as well as um, increasing the, the trainings that they're doing. Um, so that's another area um, of, of increase. Well, I think there's also concern on the other side. How many police are we down to? I mean, ideally, we're supposed to be staffed at 17 or 18. Right. What are we yeah. staffed at right now? Well, we have um, uh, budgeted uh, Enough, the, enough positions to uh, maintain the, you know, the 16 or 17 officers that we need for a full-time department. I think we are still looking to hire a one. So I think at least there's, there's at least one position open. So if anyone knows, um, uh, you know, a good officer who's looking for uh, a position, we might have a spot for them here. Um, but uh, that uh, we're, we're kind of at the, the minimum number of officers we need for um to run a full-time department. And so that's, that's where we're at and that's what we're maintaining. Though to be fair, we are also um, adding, uh, uh, so uh, we did recently, like I think within last year, not it's not new to this budget, but we added a, a social worker embedded in the department. Um, and that person I, I hear has been used really very well and uh, the response has been good. Um, so we're looking to potentially add another uh, social worker and we're also looking to increase our um, uh, uh, peer support, like uh, outreach um, uh, positions as well. We share the um, social work position with Barry, yes? Yes, that's right. Would we share another one with Barry or? No, this, um, what we're looking to add would be just for Montpelier. What is a peer support person in a police context? Well, so a, a, a peer support person or, um, which I guess is uh, is a little bit uh, different from the, the street outreach uh, uh, worker um, is someone that uh, can be, be a, a connection point or a liaison sort of between, um, you know, folks who may be experiencing homelessness and uh, and the either department or other, just other services in general. Let's go into homelessness and, and sure. treating that population. How big do you estimate that population is in Montpelier? Well, that's a good question. So um, I'm told that Montpelier has about 40 uh, individuals who uh, are cr chronically homeless in Montpelier. Uh, and with the closing of uh, the local or the, the hotel program uh, where, you know, folks were able to stay in hotels through COVID, uh, but that, you know, program was coming to an end, we were anticipating roughly another um, 40 or 50 folks um, but unclear as to whether they were going to uh, stay in Montpelier or go elsewhere. Um, so it, there definitely has been an increase uh, recently, but um, I don't have numbers beyond that, that 40 folks who we, we know are, are sort of chronically around. Homeless. Now, that's a very wide definition. That's a pretty, uh, and on one level, it's very simple and they, they lack a place that they live in on a regular sure. basis. On another one, isn't that a population that has people who work two or three jobs and simply can't afford an apartment? All the yeah, way down certainly. To people and who have no predilection for work whatsoever. Sure. Yeah. And uh, we know that folks end up uh, being homeless uh, for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, everyone's not sort of there for the, the same reasons. And, and so helping them get out of uh, that situation, you know, getting to be housed is, um, you know, that there's a lot of different strategies there to help folks uh, because they're not all there for the same reason. Uh, the uh, new um, housing structure for them over on 302, um, 
over by um, uh, the auto dealership. What is the status of that project? And what did we contribute to that project? Are you uh, referring to Downstreet's project to build um, uh, some, like a shelter for- Exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so they they did uh, request some money from us and uh, because that was one of the things that um, ARPA money could go towards. And so we Stop. did- acronym, yeah. ARPA. Oh, sorry, thank you. Um, uh, it's the American Rescue Plan Act money. And it's, so it's federal money uh, that is coming to municipalities and we do have some flexibility as to how to spend it. Um, and so we did um, allocate uh, I think it was something like forty thousand uh, dollars to go to um, to Downstreet to help with uh, the construction of this project. And so beyond that, I don't know um, where they're at with it. But uh, I think how it's, many, how it's many an important. How people would be housed in this project? Would this take care of a significant amount of the issue of homelessness? Well, I don't know that it'll be. Um, you know, it's not going to be a solution. Um, but I do think it's um, it, it's going to be uh, helpful for uh, that you know, particular uh, population, though I, I can't tell you how many beds there are there. Um, the structure over by Shaw's, uh, could you discuss the thought behind moving that structure from further back to right in commercial downtown? Sure, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, originally that structure was placed on the bike path uh, on the Sibuinabi um, uh, shared use path that uh, it, it was right behind the, basically like the- um, Over by the bridge. Yeah, the it's department of the motor vehicles, it was sort of back right. there. And uh, a lot of folks uh, who were coming off the bridge and going around the corner um, found that uh, to be really tight. And uh, especially when there were people there, um, who might you know be calling out things at them or whatnot? It was just a very like scary um, corner for some folks, and so uh, we moved it so that it would open up that space a little bit and um, hopefully encourage folks to continue to use the, the shared use path. And so then the question became, well, where do we move it? And we knew a lot of folks were using it where it was. And so we didn't want to move it very far away and that land was available. Um, also, there is a, um, we really wanted to keep it uh, sort of near the river. And so it, it, is, it is still near the river there. And um, the, uh, uh, there was a lot of discussion as to um, whether it should uh, face away from the street or towards the street. And that was um, a discussion that I was not involved in, but uh, that it, I believe it was in um, the design review committee, but I, I could be wrong, but there, the homelessness task force was very much involved in, in those discussions. And to be yeah. fair, go on, sorry, go please. ahead. No, go also, on. to be fair, that is a, a piece of property that the city has sort of yet to determine um, what it's going to do with. Uh, right now, the city owns that sort of little triangle of property, uh, but we, we could turn it into an official park uh, for the city, or we could sell it and build a building there. Um, and we haven't, we've not yet had that discussion. Do you foresee a day when Montpelier families could use that facility again? You know, I would certainly hope so. Um, I imagine that you're talking about just the structure specifically. Yeah, I'm talking about the fact that pretty much the people who are using it are people who don't work, people who yeah. have leisure time. Do you ever see that coming back again for broader public use? Well, sure. I mean, if that um, structure were to move again, um, it's very possible that it might end up in a little location where it's not as easy to gather. And so, um, you know, if it, if it ends up in, you know, for example, Hubbard Park, that was another place that we discussed or um, somewhere out um, further out on the bike path. Uh, I think that certainly is a possibility. Uh, but for now, you know, it's, it's I, I, to be fair, I, I do feel like it is, it's serving a, a purpose for um, a set of folks. And, um, you know, that's, it, that's that's okay for now. I mean, and we'll we'll see um, how it evolves. Um, the Parks Commission at their last meeting said that there will be no camping. There will be no living in that park after dark. Do you yeah. agree with that? Should should yeah. there be people allowed to camp out in that park after dark? 
That's a great question. And uh, it's the, the answer is, is a little bit complicated. Um, and so the reason is because um, the, the city recently came up with a, an encampment, an emergency camping policy uh, that said that there were certain criteria that would need to be met in order for, a, um, for someone to not be allowed to camp in a certain location. Uh, and so, you know, some places in Hubbard Park would meet that those criteria and other places might not. And I think that actually it, it highlights, I think, this really interesting, um, uh, I guess I'd call it either a conflict or an interesting Venn diagram maybe of like whose authority is it um, to regulate that uh, in, in Hubbard Park uh, or in the parks in general. Um, and because we know that uh, that authority is- um, It's a uh, you charter know, for the Parks Commission. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's you know the the maintenance and the uh, maintaining oversight. of the and the, yeah and the oversight uh, comes to or goes to the the parks commission, uh, but in terms of enforcement, it would be the police department. So of course that's um, you know under the, the city council. Which uh, anyway, I'm I'm very interested in continuing to have this dialogue and and work out um, a solution together with the parks commission, uh, so we can make sure that everybody is um, is happy and. and taken care of. What do you mean by happy and taken care of? That the Parks well, Commission so, and City Council are on the same page? Or? Yeah, well, it'd be great to, well, first, it'd be great to clarify um, the the question of authority so that we're, we're really clear on that. Um, and then I think also to make sure that um, if we can find places of common ground together with the Parks Commission, that would be great. And then also to make sure that people who are experiencing homelessness um, have a place to go, because ultimately that's um, that's that's really you know the the most dire um, concern. The city park, Hubbard Park and North Park for that matter, do not have a fire policy. There is no formal fire plan for what should happen if somebody, now call it a high school kid, because high school kids have been in Hubbard forever. If they use one of those fire pits after dark, or anyone uses it, and a fire breaks out, we don't have a plan for how to respond to that. Should we be thinking, before we're thinking about homeless people using that park, should we somehow come up with a coherent plan as to what happens if there is a fire after dark? Because for years, no one slept in that park. Sure. It's not designed for being slept in. Um, they're just three rough latrines, actually. Yeah. Well, to be fair, I, people have been sleeping in Hubbard Park. It's just that they've been sort of out of the way and out of people's notice. Right. Um, Which is easy but, to do when you have a yes, small police yes. department stretched. And it's a, it's a lot of area. Hours. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but, but that is a good point. And I think that probably would be a good proactive thing to do. Now, a part of the policy that we approved was uh, a set of, um, you can think of them as guidelines or expectations um, that of like what someone who was experiencing homelessness could expect. So, uh, you know, if, if we encountered a, um, illegal encampment, uh, you know, what would happen to the stuff and how long would the city hold on to it and where could they go to find it if they needed it, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and so we could potentially build in something like that into those, um, that's that protocol. Uh, but I could also picture that being under the auspices of the Parks Commission. So anyway, we'll open to discussion about that. In our capital budget, which is different than the operating budget, Confluence Park is in there. Yes. Would you explain what we think we're going to do with Confluence Park if that passes? Sure, yeah. When we're going to do it. And what yes. is Confluence Park? <laughs> Let's start with that. So uh, there's a, a corner where the north branch of the Winooski meets the Winooski, right by the railroad bridge behind Shaw's. And uh, right now there's a couple picnic tables there, uh, but that was um, sort of a temporary um, solution as we were exploring the possibility of turning that area into a much more uh, robust uh, park in which folks could actually get down to the water where you could you could actually um, enjoy the river. And so the Vermont River Conservancy uh, has been spearheading uh, this together with the city. And so they, they held a number of um, uh, public hearings and uh, feedback sessions 
and there were um, multiple plans drawn up for that and folks got to vote on what um, part of the plan they liked or, or what what plans they liked the most and so uh, there's a, a plan uh, in place and so if this passes then we'll um, that'll be uh, money to uh, uh, leverage further dollars from grants and whatnot and then uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, construct the vision that uh, a lot of folks uh, voted on. Um, when do you see that happening if it passes? Yeah, so if it passes, um, I mean, my anticipation would be that I think there's still more planning that needs to be done, uh, which might take another year. And then uh, in terms of construction, it might take another year <clears throat> on top of that. So it might be 2024 uh, before we see, um, uh, you know, actually, uh, you know, it, it being done uh, at the soonest. So, and, you know, these things just take time. Um, but we that's why, we, you know, we got to start now. <laughs> Okay, let's walk east a little bit from there. We'll go across the new little bridge okay. to Maine and Barrie. And okay, that is yeah. in the, the capital budget as well. Yes, so a, a different plan, uh, the downtown master plan, uh, one uh, called for a number of street improvements. And one of them was adding a, a traffic light at the corner of Barrie and Main Street. I don't know if... If uh, viewers have ever tried to turn left coming off of Berry Street, going left onto Main Street, but it is tough, especially during rush hour. Uh, and so having a street light there, we think would be uh, a real improvement. It, uh, I think it's uh, considered a, a failing intersection right now. And so uh, a street light should help that in terms of wait times, but it'll also increase uh, this pedestrian safety uh, around, uh, right around the intersection. I mean, I, I, I'm sure folks have maybe heard that, you know, there've been multiple accidents involving pedestrians right around that area. Uh, so having a, a light there will be better for everybody. Um, yeah. So a failing intersection is a euphemism for a bit dangerous? Say again, sorry? Uh, it's a euphemism for a bit dangerous? Well, uh, so it's a, it's actually a, I think it's a euphemism more for wait times. Um, you know how congested is is that intersection so but so in on top you know in addition to i mean it, so to be fair i'm pretty sure it takes into account um i know it takes into account wait times it might take into account safety i'm not sure um in that master downtown plan we talked about timing lights is that going to happen sooner or is that still in the distant future yeah so if we uh put in a uh, uh, light there, uh, then it would be the, the kind that is coordinated with the light at uh, Memorial Drive in Maine, <clears throat> or where, where North Street or Northfield Street um, uh, meets, you know, that intersection. Um, it would be coordinated with that, with that light and with the light down at uh, State and Maine. Okay, good, good. Let's keep going east. Um, regardless of what passes or doesn't pass in the bond, What's going to happen with the recreation building? Oh, yeah. So that's a great question. Well, so the recreation building, as it is, uh, is way out of code. Uh, and so it needs, it, we either as a city need to dump a lot of money into it to get it up to code, or we need to, um, or we need to sell it. I mean, it's, um, it's a relatively small space that is, meeting some but not all of our recreation needs for the city uh, but you know as um, as we uh, a while ago asked the community you know what do you want to do in terms of recreation uh, and we had a, a survey that was put out and folks were pretty um, hesitant to um, to build a new building or um, we asked about a pool people were hesitant about a pool or they, a lot of folks wanted a pool but you know didn't want to pay for it um, and so all of that led us to saying okay well we'll invest in this property and uh, we'll get it up to speed. But as, as we uh, came up with plans and uh, you know the designs and engineering plans, it became clear that we were going to need to spend millions of dollars just to get that building up to speed. And uh, so you know, we, we realized that like, well, if we we're gonna spend millions of dollars anyway, then you know, why not in look into um, building an, a brand new facility that could uh, be better at meeting the needs for the community. In terms of building a facility, there's always two sides. 
there's capital to build the thing and there's operating to operate the thing. Sure. Uh, this budget has five people in the recreation department and a number of them work on that, on the summer camp and the pool. Yeah. And then there's a minimal skeleton staff that contracts out for recreation stuff during the year. Yep. As a community, are we ready to take that department and see it double or triple or quadruple for a new facility? Well, so um, one question would be like, would a new facility like that require significantly more staff? Because our, our staff right now is um, very much involved in, in scheduling and, um, and so uh, what we're looking at with the recreation um, uh, department, uh, I'm sorry, with the, with the bond for the Elks Club uh, is a potential uh, partnership with an external uh, recreation organization called the Hub. And so they would be uh, running a lot of recreation um, programs there as well and uh, potentially leasing space from the city. So um, that's, that's the model that I'm anticipating anyway. And, uh, but we'll see if that bond passes. Okay. I was just heading out towards the Elks property. What's oh, the sure. rationale behind the, Elks, the purchase of the Elks property? Because one of the concerns that people had when we, I remember that survey, we didn't want to move it to the school because that would be too far for people to get to. Yeah. They wanted it within the core city more. And that's anything but in the core city. And you would yeah. need a car to get out to that facility. Yeah. Well, so to be fair, I don't know that the high school was ever really an option. And the reason is because, I mean, as a, an employee of the, the city and uh, as someone who uses the fields around it frequently, um, <laughs> I know that the, all that land is is spoken used. for. It's all spoken for. Like it is all used. And I think that um, the city would be. Um, well, I think that also, I think people are talking about um, the rec field because one of those fields could have been repurposed. Oh, like the, putting, like the Dog River fields? Um, I don't think anyone was talking. I think they were talking more on Elm Street. Over by oh, the baseball you mean the field. recreation fields? Oh, I'm sorry. The recreation center out there and they didn't want to move it out because it just seemed too far. Yeah, yeah. The Elks oh, facility is way far from the core city. It is farther, but uh, the nice thing about that is we do have a bike path, uh, a shared use path that goes pretty much all the way out there. So theoretically, it is you know accessible by bike. It's a good which hike. Is, what's that? That's a good hike. It is a good hike. That's true. Um, but I've also heard that the majority of folks who use our current rec facilities are um, coming there by car anyway, uh, and the parking is pretty limited as it is. So, oh, wait, uh, well, that's your neighborhood. Yeah, so in a, in a sense, um, it would be not not terribly different um, in that way. Um, there had been some discussion of putting low income housing on that area. What is that about? Is that just wishful thinking? Well, so uh, if the city had control of that property, then um, I mean, it's like 138 acres. It is a significant amount of property. Uh, and so uh, we could go through the process of um, soliciting, uh, you know, somewhat a developer to develop uh, uh, housing, you know, of mixed, uh, mixed incomes or low income or, um, you know, whatever you know, comes out of, the, of a, a public process there to uh, to go on to that property. So that's, it's a real possibility, uh, but we'll see, again, we'll see if the bond passes. Um, tax incremental financing. Yes. Would you discuss what that is? And then does that, I know that district does not go all the way out to there. Would right. that district go all the way out to there? It does not, but to, uh, first, what is tax increment financing? Exactly. Right, so, uh, so it's a program through the state that, um, uh, in a sense, uh, we take a sort of a snapshot in time of the value of the properties uh, in a certain designated area. And uh, so for Montpelier, it's, uh, I believe it goes something like from the corner of Bailey uh, and State all the way out to... Um, well, it goes uh, past the distillery, obviously. Yeah, to, well, yeah, out to Saban's Pasture. Um, and so that... Uh, the, the assumption is that um, folks will continue to, to, to pay property taxes on that appraised value at that one snapshot in time and any 
improvement uh, on the property, like let's say somebody were to um, build a structure that didn't exist, um, so the taxes would theoretically go up on that uh, property, anything above what it was paying in taxes, um, uh, some of that uh, goes, some of that they do, you know, it still goes to the city, but, uh, or it still goes to um, the education fund and it still, you know, is taxed regularly, but a portion of that uh, it goes towards um, paying for any improvements that the city might need to do to enable that development to happen in the first place. So, you know, for example, let's say they, you know, this new building needed um, a new water and sewer line um, and the city could use that anticipated increment, uh, the what is over and above the value of um, the anticipated uh, value of the property uh, to pay for that, um, those improvements like water and sewer, or it could be used for things like, um, you know, improving uh, intersections, um, you know, for traffic flow or whatnot, um, things that uh, the city would need to do, um, you know, to spend money on to enable uh, a, um, a development to occur. Uh, and so, but ultimately it's a, it's a win for the city and, and that, uh, that tax increment financing um, or uh, that program ends up going away after like 20 years. Are we talking about extending it out there? Oh, do you mean out to that property? Exactly. Um, that's not something that we've talked about yet, um, but uh, it seems like it's worth a conversation. Now I want to come back into town. Um, okay. The uh, savings pasture bond um, was a long time ago. Our kid was at Union Elementary when that came up. Our kid is graduating from graduate school this semester. It's very exciting. Nothing, nothing has happened in savings pasture. What, what do we look for in terms of housing and savings pasture? Uh, well, I mean, my understanding is that <clears throat> there is discussion about uh, some plans for that uh, site. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know where they're at with uh, that development at this point. Um, let me go back to the police department. Okay. We had a commission that looked at the police department. Why? What was the, what was the, I understood at the time what the problem was in, in Minnesota and in other cities. What was the problem here? What, what was the problem that people had with Tony's police department and Brian's police department? That sure. spawned city council to say, we've got to take a serious look at our place. Yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, so, so uh, I mean, I think there's layers to that. So um, the first layer is that, you know, there was a, a national racial reckoning around uh, police accountability and, and that we are certainly no exception in terms of like, you know, needing to take a hard look. You know, everyone was taking a hard look at at their uh, policing practices, or they they should have been, you know, at, at that point, and um, and I think it's it's fair that we that we did that as well. And I know a lot of folks had um, particular uh, concerns that they had experienced either with the police department or, um, you know, there was general um, concern about like what happened um, it was the the shooting uh, deaths of um, several. Um, of a couple of people, including um, Mark Johnson. And so, you know, the, there was a question about, well, so where, what are our policies and what are, our, um, you know, are there ways to make um, our, our practices uh, more inclusive and more welcoming um, and, were and just city council better for everybody? Were you hearing that? that? You were on city council during those shootings. Yes. You were on city council for years. Were you hearing that from, from people that there was, a problem with inclusion with racial profiling in our police department? Um, I wasn't hearing it um, very much, no, but, um, and uh, there is some data out there about uh, uh, policing uh, and racial profiling uh, for, you know, police departments across the state and Montpelier's police department actually had, did, had done very well, but that's not to say that we, um, uh, don't have areas where we can improve because, you know, I, I want us to be you know, exemplary and I want us to be leaders um, in the state, as, especially, you know, in terms of our policing. Um, so it never hurts, you know, I feel like there's always, it doesn't matter where, we are, where we're at, there's always room for improvement. And, uh, you know, it was, it was an opportunity to, to do that, to take now a look at how we can- recommended improve. body cams. Yes. Uh, will there be a policy for how that 
footage is dealt with? Well, um, I believe there's state statute around that already. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what authority uh, or space we have to um, create more um, regulations around, uh, around that. Um, but I think that I know that uh, uh, our chief, Chief Pete, has been uh, thinking a lot about that and is, is comfortable moving forward. Now, we're going to see more data on the police and what they do online sometime in the future. It's embedded in this budget. Well, so that's a good question. So uh, we were just talking about this actually at our most recent city council meeting. Uh, the uh, data transparency is, um, is a tough one. You would think that it would be relatively straightforward or, or easy to just say, well, we're just gonna publish this information. I mean. I certainly have been very interested in like, you know, being able to go to the city website and say, you know, how many, um, you know, burglaries have there been or, you know, how many um, crimes have there been of this type or, um, you know, how many incidences of, uh, you know, people of color being arrested or, or whatnot. Uh, but it turns out that um, getting that data is, um, we would need an entirely new data management system. And the kinds of uh, management systems that have the capacity to do that level of inquiry are on the scale of like $300,000, no. which well, I was shocked at, uh, but that, uh, that's apparently um, uh, what, what it would take to get to that level. Uh, and so, there, we are working towards more data transparency with the department. Um, and I believe the, the current plan is that we're, we have an intern uh, get, that's gonna be working with the police department um, this summer, who's gonna do a lot of data analysis for us. Um, but that may not be a great solution indefinitely, uh, you know, moving on into the, the future. Are we are just gonna be dependent on interns for data analysis um, forever. Uh, I, I would love to see us move towards, uh, you know, this this kind of level of transparency. But uh, you know, we don't have the the three hundred thousand uh, to just, you know, you know, add into the budget at this point. What else in that report is City Council going to consider? Oh, from there the police. More to that. Yeah, there was more to that report. Yes, yes, there uh, was quite a bit actually. Uh, so. Uh, there are a number of, of issues, some of which the police department uh, agreed with, some of them they were sort of neutral on, and some of them they, they um, did not agree with or they, they were not interested in pursuing. Um, so a lot of the, the ones that, uh, the, a lot of the findings that the committee came up with that they did agree with that had financial implications are actually already uh, packaged in this budget. Uh, you know, there, there are things like the body worn cameras, there are um, uh, increased um, uh, trainings for the police department, uh, you know, around uh, crowd management, around working with youth, around youth, um, working with um, folks with uh, mental uh, health issues. Um, so, and all of that, I think, is, is on the right track and, and something that we ought to be doing. So uh, I'm really glad to say that, that those things are in there. Um, but other things, in one of the pieces was this data transparency um, piece. Another um, uh, was uh, the, they was a there was a recommendation around allowing uh, for uh, basically open containers, like uh, uh, public, like decriminalizing uh, drinking in public, uh, basically. Um, and so that that's one that uh, you know, we'll see if that uh, that passes. I think there'll be a lot of discussion about that. There was a recommendation to decriminalize um, uh, prostitution uh, Can you or sex even do work. That? How, What's that? That's state code. How do you locally override Vermont state code on prostitution? Well, so so to be fair, uh, it's um, it. We have both there. So you're right. There is a state um, statute against that. Uh, but there's also, um, we have a local ordinance uh, prohibiting it as well. Oh, uh, okay. And so the proposal would be to, to with, you know, to, to rescind the, the local or repeal the local um, ordinance against it. And, um, and again, that, that I think will, um, you know, any one of these items could take, um, 
an entire city council evening. Um, that, so uh, we, in, we have not actually enacted any of those things. We've not repealed that, um, that measure against prostitution or uh, against public drinking. Um, but uh, I do anticipate that we may have those conversations um, over the coming year or so. Now, I don't want to tie this in with the police report because it wasn't, but it just came to mind. The social equity consultant. Yes. What, what does he or she do? So, uh, and that how was much a is that budgeted for? Sure. So um, that was a contract that we um, had over uh, the last year. And um, I, uh, that's a good question. I'm, uh, I'm not sure how much they are uh, budgeted for this year. I don't. Uh, it's it's not 40, an indefinite. 000. What's that? I think it's forty thousand. I think you're right. I think it is forty thousand. Um, but it, this is not sort of an indefinite um, relationship. Uh, so what they did for us this last year was they did a needs assessment for the city to analyze how we were doing in terms of equity um, across our our local government. Like what are how are folks feeling um, about participating? Uh, what were practices that were um, either working or not working um, for uh, uh, you know, the breadth of our community of uh, folks of all backgrounds and races and ethnicities um, and, and uh, income levels really as well. So uh, one of the recommendations that came out of that, um, that needs assessment was uh, this idea that some folks actually cannot uh, participate in committees uh, that, you know, they might not go up for appointments uh, to, uh, to participate in our, our local government in that way because uh, they either need to be working or they can't uh, pay like a babysitter or, or whatnot. Um, and to be fair, you know, all generally speaking, most of the folks who are uh, in local government now are either sufficiently employed or overemployed, uh, where they can uh, they can afford to take that time off and volunteer. Uh, so one of the recommendations was that we should have stipends available uh, to participants at, at, on our committees uh, to um, encourage folks from all you know economic backgrounds to participate. And I'm going to edit this in back, back okay. when we talk about the. Um, the police issue. Uh, okay. One of the elements of the police report was the Civilian Police Review Board. Essentially, I don't oh, think yes. it's called that. But would you yes. explain what the rationale for a Civilian Police Review Board and whether you've been on council forever, do you believe that a Civilian Police Review Board is merited? You've had the chance to read their report. You've sat on council. Would you explain what a civilian police review board would do, who they envision sitting on that board, and why you think it's a good or a bad idea? Well, that's a good question. Um, so for a police um, review board or oversight uh, board, um, what this um, could potentially mean for the city is uh, that there would be a, a group of um, Montpelier uh, residents, um, particularly, I think the, the recommendation was uh, intended to have this group be um, folks so who spend a lot of time looking at, uh, you know, policing issues and, and who are effectively, you know, content experts or become content experts uh, in terms of uh, dealing with uh, issues around the police. Um, and the idea was would be that, uh, that they would uh, hear complaints uh, or concerns from the public, uh, or that there'd be some kind of a review process um, if there is, um, uh, you know, use of force incidents, that kind of thing. Um, now, to be fair, uh, the one of the questions that I um, have is, um, you know, thinking about the authority that a, such a board would do. Um, is, you know, what would, you know, the board have, the, yeah, what would they have the authority to do? And so, um, and is that authority um, already being met somewhere else? You know, I, I think this is a topic that we're going to end up having more conversation on. Um, and and uh, one of the other recommendations from this uh, committee was uh, to have a use of force uh, policy. So anytime, you know, a, an incident that is either a, um, you know, where force was used, or if there is a shooting, that kind of thing, um, that there should be a, a policy that the the um, police department follows uh, to help get information out 
um, about it. Uh, and uh, so one of the things that they were willing to do, this the police review committee um, was willing to help shape uh, what this policy could look like. And the police department was actually very receptive to that. So, you know, welcoming a conversation about having a, a use of force policy. Um, but as for a review board, um, you know, as of right now, this, uh, you know, such a board would not have the authority to say, like, dismiss an officer or even to, like, um, reprimand um, him in any or her in any or them <laughs> in any meaningful way. Um, and so, and the question in my mind sort of becomes um, sort of why, like what what function um, would we anticipate um, that they would serve? Uh, someone I know said when they were talking about appointing themselves because they were experts, uh, their logic was that you don't appoint experts on a jury and that it would be better just to go to John Odom's office, go down a random list of voters and say, would you like to serve on this? so that the average person from Montpelier would be sitting in a judging their police department. Isn't there a logic behind that as well? You know, I, I, could, I could see that, um, but I, I also think that there are, um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about um, police and the best practices of uh, a police department and, and knowing what the best practices even are. Uh, so, and I, I think that that takes time to get up to speed on. So, um, you know, I think there is a, a place for sort of like the random selection, and I, but I don't think that would be um, useful for, for this particular kind of committee. If re-elected mayor, what are your priorities? Yeah, great question. Uh, so um, as we mentioned towards the beginning, I continue to be passionate about uh, the environment uh, we know from the science that we have a limited amount of time to make significant progress on reducing uh, carbon emissions uh, worldwide, and Montpelier needs to do its part. And uh, so both uh, reducing our carbon as well as anticipating a, um, a, a hotter, wetter, more chaotic climate um, in Montpelier is something that is a, a top priority for me. Um, and I have lots of thoughts as to how we can do that. There are specific uh, projects and plans that I am anticipating that we can um, that we can do. Uh, and then a second priority is that we know that um, there is not uh, sufficient childcare in central Vermont, particularly for um, meeting the the hours of uh, typical working family, uh, nor for um, very young children from zero to five years of age. And I, uh, childcare is a, a tough business to be in, and I think the city can play uh, a, a better role in meeting that need for central Vermont. So I'm very interested in, in the city taking on uh, that service to the to the city, especially in terms of like getting folks back to work and even just like we, we know that uh, those uh, uh, those zero to five year old um, ages, those are essential years for young kids in terms of their development. So it's literally an investment in our future. Uh, and then um, another um, thing would be um, would be infrastructure. We just need to be catching up on our on our infrastructure. Uh, we've had a couple years now due to COVID that we had to put uh, put off projects, we had to postpone projects, uh, and it's time to, to get back on the horse there and uh, catch up to where we need to be. One final one. There's a freak out coming, the reappraisal. Oh, yes. There's a sense already that, that it's really expensive to get into Montpelier and that this could become a gated community. Can you address that? I mean, it's going to be a freak out when people see the new appraised value. Right. Well, so um, I think it's important for folks to um, uh, recognize that uh, when we do a reappraisal, it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that your taxes are going to go up uh, because everyone's being assessed. So, uh, you know, if the entire market is um, floating at a higher level, uh, then let's say everyone's house went up by the same percentage, um, then everyone's taxes would literally stay the same. Uh, but um, if, even though your home value had, had gone up, so it's really how much your home value has changed relative to, um, to uh, the rest of the city, so to speak. Um, so that's, that's one 
um, thing to keep in mind. Uh, and the other thing that uh, you know, I sort of want to remind folks about is that uh, for a lot of homeowners, uh, there are protections, uh, at least in terms of taxes, in terms of something called um, uh, income sensitivity and the circuit breaker. So if uh, someone owns their home and they're um, making below a certain threshold, uh, then their their taxes are or their their education taxes um, are. Are limited. They're cut actually, uh, in light of the fact that they don't make as much money. Um, that's called the income sensitivity. And then there's a a, a different threshold for if you make a below a certain other amount of money um, that uh, that your uh, city your uh, your city taxes are cut as well. Um, so there are protections built in for um, low income folks. Um, but the other thing that that I am certainly thinking about there are is the renting community. Uh, Montpelier has approximately 40% of its housing stock uh, tied up in rentals. And um, we, we know that the, the rental market in Montpelier is very expensive. Um, and so that's something that I'm certainly thinking about and interested in like how we can make um, Montpelier more affordable, particularly for, uh, for a renting community. Uh, and that's, that's a tough um, thing because, you know, we're, we're, um, you know, not we're popular. Not uh, doing rent control, and and uh, there may be some other tools that we can look at, uh, but otherwise, it's a sort of an indirect uh, relationship. So, um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I that I'm particularly interested in uh, in with the renting community is uh, energy justice. You know, for for folks that uh, have to um, pay for their own heat or electricity. Uh, a lot of times, you know, there's they don't have the 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 agency or um, the authority really to make energy improvements in their home because uh, it's owned by someone else, uh, and so uh, they, you know, renters often end up getting stuck paying higher uh, costs for energy, and so that's something that I'm I'm very interested in, um, in in addressing as well. And as the sitting mayor, and today that this is being filmed is Tuesday. Uh, as of Tuesday right now, how long are we going to wear masks? What is the state of masking right now? And what do, when do you see the masks leaving? That's a great question. Uh, so at our last city council meeting, we did just renew our mask mandate uh, for, I believe, um, 30 days or so, uh, which takes us into sort of mid-March. Um, um, though I don't know the, the exact date off the top of my head as to when it would expire, but um, I think, you know, as we, I think we're going to continue to look at the COVID cases, uh, you know, it looks like the Omicron spike might be over, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm certainly hopeful about that, but we also don't want to make a, a hasty decision um, because we do know that a lot of folks um, specifically come to Montpelier to shop because we have this mask mandate in place and we wanna make sure that uh, folks feel comfortable coming to shop in Montpelier. I know there are some folks who hate that, who uh, really don't wanna wear masks, um, but I think the majority of uh, the people that I'm hearing from, um, you know, even if they are not feeling um, threatened by COVID at this point, it's an act of kindness and generosity to our our um, our neighbors to uh, our our fellow residents, uh, and so as as an act of kindness, you know, I, I think that's um, that's an admirable thing, and uh, we're, we're going to keep it in place uh, until uh, this is really under control. So we might have a situation where the masks come off in schools, but not in the businesses and city. That buildings. is that is very possible, um, and. Um, you know, we'll, we'll deal with that as, as we, as we get there. Yeah. That's great. And the final question, uh, will there ever be mayor meetings again, uh, a time when the mayor will be back in city hall to meet with people? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, I, I do hope to be meeting with people uh, in person once uh, COVID is, you know, more, again, more under control, but I am actually having, um, virtual office hours. Uh, would you tell us every... how and when? Yes. How do you so, get to um, it and when is it? That's a great question. So um, uh, Sundays at 2 p.m. Um, I'm going to be hosting office hours. And uh, so 
in order to avoid you know zoom bombs and all of that i'm, I'm asking folks to email me uh and uh to request to join and uh and i'll send send them a link um so they can email my my city address or um uh or uh ann at uh watson for montpelier.com and uh that's all, you can email that is that address as well and request a, a link to to join for virtual office hours Thank you for watching Ann Watson, who's running again for mayor, another term. And get out there and vote on town meeting day. It's really important that, that you do, that you weigh in, not only on city, but on schools, on the park commission, on the safety commission, on um, the cemetery board, and of course the two budgets as well as the capital budget. So take your time, get out and vote, or return the ballot. Take care.